Welcome back to my Care Central. This is the second video in our series on pupil and pupillary abnormalities. In the previous video, we discussed pupillary constriction, which is mediated by the parasympathetic pathway. In this video, we will be discussing pupillary dilation, which is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. Pupillary dilation is affected by the intensity of the ambient light. It is also affected by various other factors that activate the sympathetic system, like being in a stressful situation, feelings of pain, fear, etc. The sympathetic arc is also known as the oculosympathetic pathway. It begins in the hypothalamus and it acts by causing the contraction of the dilator pupillae muscle of the iris. This causes increase in the size of the pupil and this increase in the size of the pupil is known as midriasis. Oculosympathetic pathway is a three neuron pathway. First order neurons originate in the posterior lateral area of the hypothalamus. Then they descend uncrossed through the brainstem and they finally reach the spinal cord to terminate at the C8T2 level. This area of the spinal cord is known as the ciliospinal center of budge. These first order neurons are preganglionic neurons. From the ciliospinal center of budge, second order neurons arise. These are also preganglionic neurons because no synapse of nerve fibers has taken place yet. The second order neurons exit the spinal cord and then they enter the cervical sympathetic chain. Here, the sympathetic fibers are very closely related to the apex of the lungs. This is important to know because lesions of the apex of the pleura or the lungs can cause damage to the sympathetic pathway. Within the cervical sympathetic chain, the fibers ascend to reach the superior cervical ganglion where they synapse. Superior cervical ganglion lies at the base of the skull, near about the same level where the common carotid artery also bifurcates into the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. Third order neurons arise from the superior cervical ganglion. These are postganglionic nerve fibers. Nerve fibers of the sympathetic chain have pupillomotor fibers which control the size of the pupil. They also have vasomotor fibers that control the tone of the blood vessels and pseudomotor fibers which control sweating. Out of these, pupillomotor fibers continue to travel along the internal carotid artery while the vasomotor and pseudomotor fibers take a separate route and they go along the external carotid artery. As the internal carotid artery enters the skull, sympathetic fibers traveling along with it reach the cavernous sinus. One important thing to note here is that within the cavernous sinus, for a brief moment, sympathetic fibers leave the carotid plexus and join the sixth cranial nerve. This anatomical relationship is important because lesions of the sixth cranial nerve may sometimes be associated with defects of the sympathetic pathway. Though this is quite rare, but in these cases, we can localize the lesions to the cavernous sinus. Nerve fibers eventually enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, traveling along the ophthalmic division, which is the first division of the trigeminal nerve. It is finally through the nasociliary nerve, which is a branch of the ophthalmic division, that further branches into the long ciliary nerves, that the pupillomotor fibers innervate the dilator pupillae muscle of the iris. Sympathetic fibers also innervate the smooth muscles that are present in the upper and the lower eyelids. So, Horner's syndrome can arise from any damage that may occur along this oculosympathetic pathway, starting from the brainstem to the postganglionic nerve endings. Epidemiology of Horner's syndrome Horner's syndrome is quite an uncommon condition. There is no age, race, or gender predilection. Horner's syndrome can be congenital or acquired or very very rarely it can be hereditary with autosomal dominant inheritance. Horner's syndrome can also be subdivided into central Horner's if the first order neurons are affected and peripheral Horner's if the second or the third order neurons are affected. Another way to classify Horner's is into preganglionic Horner's which occurs when the lesion is present before the fiber synapse at the superior cervical ganglion. So basically the first and the second order neuron lesions. Postganglionic Horner's is when the lesion occurs after their synapse at the superior cervical ganglion, that is at the third order neuron level. Diagnosis of Horner's syndrome. The diagnosis of Horner's is a three-step process. We start with clinical history and examination. 
then we do pharmacological testing and finally we go for diagnostic imaging. Horner's is characterized by a classic triad of meiosis, ptosis and anhydrosis. Meiosis means constriction of the pupil. So in Horner's disease, the pupil on the affected side appears smaller than the pupil on the normal side. For example, suppose this patient has a left-sided Horner's. We can clearly see anisocoria here. Now what is the meaning of anisocoria? Anisocoria is when the size of the two pupils is different. An means not, iso means same and coria means pupil. So anisocoria means not same or we can say different sizes of pupil. Alternatively, one can say that the pupil is larger on the right side than the left side. So how do we know which side is affected? What if the side where the pupil is larger is the defective eye and the eye with the smaller pupil is the normal eye? To determine this, we check the change in anisocoria in darkness and in bright light. In darkness, our pupils dilate and this is mediated by the sympathetic pathway. So when we dim the lights, the pupil on the right side which is the normal eye will respond by dilating rapidly because its sympathetic system is working normally. But the pupil of the left eye will dilate slowly or sometimes it may not even dilate at all because its sympathetic pathway is defective. This will cause increase in anisocoria in dim light. You can see here in these before and after diagrams that the anisocoria, that is the difference between the size of the two pupils, is more in darkness. Now let's consider the alternate scenario. Suppose the defect is in the right eye and instead of the left pupil being smaller than normal, it is the right pupil which is larger because of some defect in the parasympathetic pathway which controls pupillary constriction. Thus, in this case, when the eyes are exposed to bright light, the right eye would not constrict properly while the left eye would have normal pupillary constriction. This will increase the anisocoria again but now in this case the anisocoria is greater in bright light. So broadly speaking, if the anisocoria increases in darkness, it is a sympathetic defect that is Horner's syndrome and the eye with the smaller pupil is the defective eye. And if the anisocoria increases in brightness, it is a parasympathetic defect and the eye with the larger pupil is the defective eye. One more characteristic feature of Horner's pupil is dilation lag. When dilation of the pupils is assessed in dim light, the anisocoria is greatest in the first 5 seconds of examination. After 10 to 15 seconds of darkness, the anisocoria becomes less obvious because the pupil of the affected eye catches up means it eventually increases to some degree of dilation and the anisocoria is not as much as was seen in the initial few seconds of examination. This slow dilation of the pupil of the affected eye when compared with the quick dilation in the fellow eye is known as dilation lag, means the affected eye lags behind in terms of dilation. How does the Horner's pupil respond to bright light? Now when this patient is exposed to bright light, both the pupils will react by constricting normally. Also, the near reflex would be normal in this case because both the light reflex as well as the near reflex are controlled by the parasympathetic system. Thus, anisocoria would not change in bright light. However, once the light stimulus is removed and the pupils start returning to their normal resting position, the pupil on the affected side will redilate slowly due to dilation lag. Besides the intensity of light, some stressful situations like pain and sudden loud noises can also increase anisocoria because they cause increase in the sympathetic outflow, thus causing dilation of the pupil on the normal side but no response on the side with Horner syndrome where the sympathetic pathway is defective. An important differential diagnosis of Horner syndrome is physiological anisocoria, which is also known as essential anisocoria. Physiological anisocoria is seen in almost 20% of the normal population. Here, the anisocoria is usually less than 1 mm. It is equal in both light as well as darkness. Sometimes, physiological anisocoria may also increase in darkness, just like Horner syndrome in which case pharmacological testing is done to differentiate between the two and we will discuss this in detail later. Physiological anisocoria does not have any other associated signs seen in Horner syndrome 
like ptosis and hydrosis, heterochromia, etc. So the second characteristic feature of Horner's is ptosis. We learned earlier that the sympathetic pathway innervates the smooth muscles of the upper and the lower lids. In the upper lid, the smooth muscle is known as the Mueller's muscle. In a normal situation, the stimulation of Mueller's muscle via the sympathetic pathway leads to lid elevation. The contribution of Mueller's to lid elevation is only about 1 to 2 mm. Thus, in Horner's syndrome, where the Mueller's muscle is affected, only mild doses of about 1 to 2 mm is seen. Similarly, the inferior eyelid shows reverse ptosis, which is also known as upside down ptosis, in which the position of the eyelid is higher than normal. This is because the smooth muscle of the lower lid that pulls the lid down loses its function. This is how the lid position looks on the affected side in Horner syndrome. The upper eyelid usually covers about 2 mm of the superior cornea, as you can see on the normal side. Here it covers more of it. While the lower lid is normally positioned right at the inferior limbus, but in reverse doses that is seen on the lower lid, it covers a part of the inferior cornea as well. Now this doses of the upper and the lower lids sometimes gives an impression that the eye is small and sunken into the globe, the way it looks in enophthalmos. This is known as apparent enophthalmos because enophthalmos is not present in the true sense. It just looks as if the eye is enophthalmic. True enophthalmos is not seen in Horner's syndrome. The third characteristic feature of Horner's syndrome that forms the classic triad is anhydrosis. Anhydrosis means lack of sweating. The distribution of anhydrosis depends on the site of lesion. In first order neuron lesions, anhydrosis affects the face as well as the ipsilateral half of the body. If second order neurons are affected, it causes anhydrosis of the ipsilateral half of the face. Because since the second order neuron lesions occur after they have exited the spinal cord, anhydrosis of the rest of the body does not occur. In third order postganglionic lesions that are present after the bifurcation of the common carotid artery, that is, distal to the bifurcation of the common carotid artery, anhydrosis is either absent or it is limited to a small area above the brow. Because like we learned earlier, the sweat fibers separate themselves from the sympathetic chain and they go along the external carotid artery. Thus, postganglionic oculosympathetic lesions do not cause anhydrosis, they only cause ptosis and meiosis. Though to be honest, in today's world of air conditioners, such specific details of anhydrosis are rarely reported. Other features of Horner's include iris heterochromia, Heterochromia means that the color of the iris in the two eyes is different. In Horner's syndrome, the affected eye shows a lightly pigmented iris. Iris heterochromia is suggestive of either congenital Horner's or a Horner's that had an onset before 2 years of age. That is because iris pigmentation is controlled by the sympathetic pathway and this pigmentation gets completed by 2 years of age. Thus, any interruption of sympathetic pathway before 2 years of age can disturb the process of iris pigmentation and it can lead to heterochromia. Certain features of Horner's syndrome are rare and transient. They include increase in the amplitude of accommodation, which can affect near vision, transient hypotony of the globe, redness of the eye, changes in tear viscosity, and asymmetric flushing of the face. This asymmetric flushing and sweating of the face is known as Harlequin sign. Harlequin sign is usually seen in children with Horner syndrome, where the contralateral side shows flushing and sweating, while the affected side is anhydrotic and blanched. Harlequin sign can also occur in adults after physical exercise. These symptoms are transient because adrenergic receptors present on the postsynaptic membrane at the neuromuscular junction develop denervation hypersensitivity. Now, what is denervation hypersensitivity? Denervation hypersensitivity, also known as denervation supersensitivity, is a compensatory mechanism that occurs as a response to denervation. A few days after denervation occurs, the receptors present on the postsynaptic membrane become upregulated. This upregulation means that they become supersensitive to even minute amounts of neurotransmitters. Thus, many features that are seen in Horner's are seen only transiently because then denervation hypersensitivity takes over. Other features of Horner's depend on the site of lesion, whether it is a first order, second order or a third order neuron lesion. 
we will discuss the important ones here first order neuron lesions the most common presentation of central horners is wallenberg syndrome wallenberg syndrome results from the occlusion of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery which can cause infarction of the area of the brain stem where the sympathetic fibers are present patient will have features of horner syndrome along with other features like dysphagia due to paralysis of the laryngeal and the pharyngeal muscles reduced sensation on ipsilateral face and contralateral body cerebellar ataxia and rotatory nystagmus other causes of central horners include lesions of the cervical cord including trauma syringomyelia spinal cord tumors and rarely demyelinating diseases an important cause of second order neuron lesion is a pancos tumor pancos tumor occurs at the apex of the lungs and the pleura and it can compress the sympathetic fibers leading to horner syndrome in fact sometimes horner syndrome may be the first sign of a pancos tumor these patients may also present with pain in the shoulder and the arm region because of infiltration of the brachial plexus by the tumor other tumors in this area that can produce horner syndrome are breast carcinomas lymphomas sarcomas and metastases another important disease that must be kept in mind while examining a patient of horner syndrome is internal carotid artery dissection carotid artery dissection occurs due to a spontaneous or a traumatic tear in the intimal layer of the carotid artery this can lead to the formation of an intramural hematoma in fact carotid dissection can even occur with minor neck jerks this intramural hematoma can either bulge inwards to block the lumen of the artery leading to a stroke or it can bulge outwards to form a pseudo aneurysm which can compress the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers such patients present with a painful horners they have ipsilateral neck pain facial pain or bital pain sometimes even transient loss of vision due to retinal ischemia or even numbness of face besides carotid artery dissection other causes of painful horners include rader syndrome and cluster headache rader syndrome is a form of headache where patient presents with features of horner syndrome with pain along the distribution of the trigeminal nerve with or without other cranial nerve palsies cluster headache is a form of migraine that can be vascular in origin it may present with horners and is usually a diagnosis of exclusion in any case if you see any patient presenting with a painful horners they should always undergo further investigations to rule out carotid dissection in the cavernous sinus lesions of the sixth nerve may also involve the sympathetic fibers so the patient can present with a sixth nerve palsy with horner syndrome this is known as parkinson sign if we see an adult patient with a truly isolated lesion which means that there is no involvement of either the cranial nerves and there is no localizing sign or symptom these cases are presumed to be vascular in origin However we always get these patients investigated for apical tumors or carotid artery dissection just to be sure Broadly speaking first order neuron lesions will have symptoms in the rest of the body as well second order neuron lesions are usually either iatrogenic as a result of surgeries done in the area of the chest and the neck or they can occur because of tumors in this region isolated third order neuron lesions without any associated signs or symptoms are presumed to be vascular in origin nonetheless always get them investigated to rule out carotid dissection before proceeding on to the pharmacological evaluation of horner syndrome we should understand some unique features of congenital horners as well we know that congenital means that the defect is present since birth but in cases of horners seen in infants we don't just assume that the disease is congenital We need to thoroughly assess and investigate each child presenting with Horner syndrome because in the pediatric population Horners can also be a sign of neuroblastoma neuroblastoma of the paravertebral sympathetic chain can be present or some other underlying disease like tumor metastasis leukemia lymphoma or aneurysm in many cases it may also be a sign of a traumatic delivery in which case the baby may also have clumkey's paralysis of the arm thus unless there is a clear cut history of trauma or of any surgical intervention in the region of the chest or the neck every case of congenital horner should be thoroughly investigated to rule out a neuroblastoma investigations include neuroimaging and 24 hour urinary catecholamine measurement unique features of congenital horners include 
heterochromia of the iris, harlequin sign, and ipsilateral straight hair. It is hypothesized that the smooth muscle of the hair follicles, that is the erector pylorum, is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, and the rhythmic contraction of this muscle causes curliness of the hair. So, if the sympathetic pathway is damaged, this innervation is lost and the child develops straight hair on the side of the lesion. This slide includes all the lesions that may give rise to Horner syndrome depending on the site of the lesion. You could pause this video and go through this list if you wish to. In doubtful cases, especially when findings are subtle or inconsistent, pharmacological testing can be performed to confirm the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. Though quite frankly, in today's scenario, pharmacological testing is more of a theoretical thing. We don't really do it because either the drops are unavailable or they are expensive or sometimes it gives false negative results. But from the exam point of view, pharmacological testing is important for you to know. Pharmacological evaluation serves two purposes. First, it confirms the diagnosis of Horner's syndrome. Second, it can help us in localizing the site of the lesion. Confirmation of Horner's is done with the help of cocaine eye drops. Cocaine eye drops are put in both the eyes of the patient and the patient is reassessed after 30 minutes. Cocaine is an indirect sympathomimetic agent, which means that it does not act on the postsynaptic receptors directly. Instead, it stimulates the receptors by preventing the reuptake of noradrenaline that is released at the myoneural junction. Thus, by preventing its reuptake, it allows more noradrenaline to be available at the site of action. This stimulates the receptors and pupillary dilation takes place. This is what is seen in a normal pupil where the oculosympathetic pathway is intact and the transmitter stores are adequate. However, in the pupil that is affected by Horner's, cocaine would not produce its effect because here noradrenaline is not present at the synaptic junction in the first place. So the question of blocking its reuptake does not arise. Thus, the affected pupil in Horner syndrome would not dilate with cocaine eye drops regardless of the site of lesion and this confirms the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. Also, the pupil in physiological anisocoria would also dilate with cocaine eye drops and this is how we differentiate between physiological anisocoria and anisocoria that is seen in Horner's. Topical cocaine is difficult to obtain, it is quite expensive, false negative results may be seen. Cocaine metabolites can be detected in the urine for up to 48 hours, which may cause trouble for people who for some reason need to undergo random drug testing. Apraclonidine eye drops are now being used at many places as an alternative to cocaine eye drops because apraclonidine is readily available as it is also used as an ocular hypotensive drug. Apraclonidine is as sensitive as cocaine in detecting Horner's with the sensitivity as high as 87%. Apraclonidine acts as a direct sympathomimetic agent because it acts directly on the postsynaptic adrenergic receptors. The adrenergic receptors present on iris dilator muscle are alpha-1 receptors. Apraclonidine is a weak alpha-1 agonist and a strong alpha-2 agonist. Since alpha-1 receptors are present on the dilator pupillae muscle, application of apraclonidine does not produce any dilation in a normal pupil because it is a weak alpha-1 agonist. However, in Horner's pupil, the phenomenon of denervation hypersensitivity occurs which leads to upregulation of these alpha-1 receptors. Because of this upregulation, these receptors become sensitive to even a weak agonist like apraclonidine and respond to apraclonidine eye drops by dilating. What we will see in such a scenario is termed as reversal of an isochoria because before apraclonidine administration, the affected eye had a smaller pupil than the normal eye. But after putting apraclonidine, the affected eye was the one with the larger pupil, so the anisocoria in this case has reversed. Denervation hypersensitivity occurs about 5 to 8 days after disease onset. Therefore, in the initial days of illness, these eye drops may give false negative results. Also, apraclonidine is contraindicated in infants and young children as it may cross the underdeveloped blood-brain barrier and cause symptoms like lethargy, bradycardia, respiratory depression, etc. just like bromonidine. Now, cocaine or apraclonidine will only tell us whether Horner's is present or not. They won't tell us the site of lesion. So, to determine the site of lesion, 
hydroxy amphetamine eye drops are used hydroxy amphetamine is an indirect sympathomimetic agent it causes release of norepinephrine that is stored in the presynaptic terminals which then stimulates the receptors and causes dilation in patients with first order or second order neuron lesions hydroxy amphetamine causes pupillary dilation because even though the preganglionic nerve fibers are affected the postganglionic pathway is intact and has noradrenaline reserves however in third order neuron lesions there is loss of terminal nerve endings and their noradrenaline stores are depleted thus hydroxy amphetamine cannot cause any noradrenergic release here therefore the pupil and postganglionic horner syndrome would not dilate with hydroxy amphetamine hydroxy amphetamine test is done at least 48 hours after cocaine test because cocaine can prevent the reuptake of hydroxy amphetamine at the synaptic cleft thereby affecting the outcome again hydroxy amphetamine can give false negative results in acute onset horners because transmitter depletion might not have occurred by then it is important to note that no eye drop can distinguish between a first order and a second order neuron lesion 1% phenylephrine eye drops can also be used as an alternative to hydroxy amphetamine eye drops phenylephrine causes midriasis in postganglionic horners due to denervation hypersensitivity but no effect is seen in normal or preganglionic lesions however some people argue that denervation supersensitivity occurs in both preganglionic and postganglionic lesions nowadays to confirm the diagnosis of horners and also to save time especially in the setting of a carotid artery dissection or a malignancy diagnostic imaging is preferred imaging helps in the diagnosis of horner syndrome in the absence of any localizing signs for the assessment of suspected first order neuron lesions mri is indicated for suspected second order or third order neuron lesions ct angiogram is the investigation of choice ct angiogram will give us a view right from the circle of villus to the orbits down to the aortic arch at about t4 t5 level this gives information about the aortic arches the carotid vessels the intracranial vessels as well as the lungs and the orbits which helps us in ruling out any vascular pathology or malignancy in cases of old long standing horners of more than 1 year duration there should be no urgency in investigating the patient always check the patient's old photographs for confirmation and then imaging can be deferred treatment of horners depends on the underlying pathology in most cases it demands a multidisciplinary approach which can include various specialties including pulmonology internal medicine neurology interventional radiology in cases of suspected carotid dissection surgery or surgical oncology and neurosurgery in suspected aneurysms so i hope this video helped you in understanding the causes clinical features and diagnosis of horner syndrome in our next video in this series on pupillary abnormalities we will be discussing rapd Until then please like and share this video with your friends and colleagues if you found it useful and please subscribe to my channel to support free education thank you very much